And now for our lunch keynote. Two years ago, Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob to many of us, was our keynote speaker. I distinctly remember Uncle Bob asking us, why isn't this the software development conference? And today, I see a lack of technical sessions in our program, and I believe we need to do better, and we can do better. And I think Michael helped fill the gap a little bit for us today. Thank you. Um, just real quick, Michael is a well-known author of the book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Uh, and I would be surprised if there's anyone in the audience who hasn't had to deal with legacy code. Uh, so with that, please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. Michael Feathers. So this is a technical keynote, or not. I don't know. I think the reason I was invited here was because of this book. It was just mentioned. I wrote this about 10 years ago now. It doesn't feel like 10 years ago because the problem still persists. Um, I've been spending a lot of time visiting teams around the world and helping them get out of terrible situations with technically de technical debt-ridden code. And uh, it's kind of awkward when you see this happen because um, we know that there are ways around this. We know that we can refactor, we can basically uh, advance our, our software development practice, but yet there still is a lot of legacy code out there in the world, right? And it's unnerving to me because there, there are things we can do about it. The thing that I find fascinating about this, though, is that it feels like the reasons why this is ha happening are something we haven't really uncovered to um, uncovered uh, well enough within the industry. And um, like I said, it's been 10 years, so I spent a lot of time helping teams with these issues, but then also a lot of time reflecting on how we get there, how these sorts of things happen. There's a parallel, de parallel development that's happening right now as well, too. Um, as was just mentioned, uh, there's like this push to go and try to get more technical content within this um, conference. Um, actually, later this week, I'm going to this other conference, the Agile Alliance Technical Conference in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. This is the first one they've ever had. And um, it's kind of fascinating because when I first heard about this, I thought, oh no, why are they doing that? Right? Um, Agile really started out with some observations by developers, okay, very early on in the 1990s, that basically the way we were developing software back then wasn't really working, right? So the founders of Agile, Agile Development sat down, tried to go and huddle together and basically gather all their knowledge and figure out ways that they could get business and development to work together in order to go and solve various problems that were endemic to the industry at that point in time. And so the idea really was we would merge together. We would do technical work, we would do business work, we'd go and sort of meld these two things together and become much better at software development. So why are our conferences having this issue right now? Okay? Why are we having this issue where basically the tech people aren't there as often, right? And the business people come, and then we have management talks, we have process talks, we have talks about story mapping, we have talks about testing, but development never really seems to be there at the table. Now, I could be reading too much into this. It could just be because um, nobody wants to look at this in the middle of lunch, right? <laughs> you know? And really, let's think about this for a second. If, if this was a strong tech conference, if this was like half tech, right, how many of you would actually go to the tech sessions? Yeah, that's quite a few, and that's good. But the thing is, it seems like there really is this cultural chasm between business and tech right now, which is kind of disconcerting. And the thing I'm noticing as well, though, is it seems like it's something which is leading to technical debt. It results in missed opportunities for us in software development. And um, there definitely are things we can do about that. Have you ever heard this phrase at all, software is eating the world? Okay. Mark Anderson, back in um, 2011, he wrote an essay with this title. And it's a great essay. And the thing is, there's nothing that's really happened since then that's really kind of like pushed against that observation that he made. Essentially, most of the high-growth industries that we have today, the high-growth companies, have software at their core, okay? Uh, somebody came up with a great idea about how to go and use software to go and do something, how to disintermediate something, how to disrupt a particular, um, a particular area, and the answer is software. So you're writing software, you're writing software in order to go and sort of move forward, have high growth, and, um, you know, do fascinating things. The thing is, though, that we really aren't attacking process from this point of view, okay? We really aren't, we aren't basically seeing how endemic software is to the work that we're doing. And um, I don't know, I just saw this on Ron Jeffrey's blog the other day. It was basically not part of a point he was making, but it was a lead into a blog that he had. 
And it was about how we go and use metrics to measure success in software development. Which ones of these actually have to do with the code itself? Which ones talk about the code? Velocity is about work, right? Iteration burn down, again, it's about the work. Burn up charts, defects in production, yes, technically that is about the code, but it's about a particular quality of the code, okay, whether certain things are working or not. But most of these things really have to do with things which are kind of off to the side of the main thing that we are actually producing when we are doing software development work, which is the code itself. Now, I don't want to go and basically sort of like sound like a complete tech head here and say, oh, you know, this is like more important than anything else in software development. But the fact of the matter is we spend an inordinate amount of time within this industry trying to deny the existence of the code. Okay? We really do. And it's like it's because it's easier to talk about just anything else, just about anything else. And so we end up in this state where we're talking about the things which are like work-oriented and culture, and it's like, you know, I love Jurgen his, his keynote this morning about managing for happiness. We talk about cultural relationships. We talk about all these different things. And there's a reason why we were doing this, right? Because back in the 90s, before Agile really first came along, um, we spent a lot of time really concentrating on the technology. The technology was really seen as the hard bit of software development. And we were really fortunate that some people stood up and said, no, no, it's about people, right? It's about us and how we interact. It's about if you get those things working, then basically software development becomes much easier. One of my favorite figures within software development is Gerald Weinberg. He's a famous consultant. And, um, a bit older now, he doesn't write quite as much as he did, but, you know, he said that as a consultant, when people bring you in, they always bring you in for a technical problem, but it's always a people problem, right? So that's part of the learning that you do as a consultant is recognizing that you're going to be dealing with people's relationships. You're going to be dealing with how they interact at work. You're going to be dealing with all these things which basically affect whether they're going to adopt particular skills or not. And so we had to basically have this period of time within the industry, but we're now in this place where it seems like we aren't really paying much attention to the code, right? And it's funny because some of the metaphors that we use in the industry are fascinating, but they feel like they kind of miss the mark a little bit. How many people have done some lean software development, right? Where does lean come from? Toyota production system, all these different things. There's a rich genesis to this you know, school of thought. But if you think about it for a second, right? Suppose you have widgets coming along an assembly line, like a car, right? You have all these cars coming down on the assembly line. It all becomes about flow. It all becomes about work in progress, all these things. And the thing that's really fascinating, though, is that when you are assembling cars, once they leave the assembly line, they're gone, right? What happens to our code? We live with it forever. And if we don't have visibility into this fact and how the changes, how the um, decisions we make affect the code, then we end up living with those effects placed back upon us again. And so we need to go and have that visibility into those things. We have to go and basically consider that to be an integral part of what we're doing. So the rest of this talk is going to be really exploring this idea at a deeper level. Um, I think that the way we ended up here is kind of, um, uh, I, I use the word fascinating all the time, right? It's fascinating to me. Agile software development started out in the early 90s, uh, middle 90s, <coughs> with a couple of different problems that were common across a couple of different companies. And the problem really was having bad relationships between business and development, right? The typical thing was for business to be able to say, oh my gosh, these developers, they can't deliver. And so we need help with this. And then the developers would say, you know, we'd love to be able to deliver, but you keep changing your minds, right? So that same story is at the center of both Scrum and Extreme Programming. And they basically arrived at a very similar way of going and dealing with that story, dealing with that problem. And what they did is they said, okay, well, look, let's go ahead and apply separation of concerns, which is a software engineering tactic, right? So we have business over here and we have development. And what we'll do is we'll basically have them communicate back and forth by features and estimates. And I remember hearing Kent Beck saying in the early days, it's kind of like, you know, as a software developer, I don't really know the business. Business people are paid to know the business. They tell me what they need, and I'll do it for them. And they don't know anything about software development, right? So I know about software development. I'll make estimates about how long it takes to do things and give those estimates back to them. And then you have things like the planning game, and you have sprint planning and all these things, which are ways of going and having a nice formal relationship between business and development. Now, of course, things have gotten... Uh, much looser since the early days of Agile. Okay? We now have product teams where you basically have developers and uh, business people working in day in and day out to go and sort of like arrive at better solutions. And it took a while for us to get there, but I still feel that we haven't gone far enough. And that we basically have the mark of this early, this early genesis that we had in our software development. Um, 
one thing I really am fascinated by is when people sometimes find systems principles. Okay, they um, uh, particular systems principles apply sometimes not only in the people realm, also in the technical realm. Have you ever heard of this one at all? Uh, Law of Leaky Abstractions by Joel Spolsky. Okay, some of you technical people may have heard about this. He was talking about something which happens in software development where you have something that you're basically trying to abstract away from, like say networks, right? You say, okay, I've got a piece of software that needs to communicate across a network, and what I want to do is I want to build an API where basically the users of the API don't need to be aware of the fact that their stuff is going to be trans transported across the network. And he said that basically this doesn't really work in general because you can't really hide things completely effectively, right? Some point in your software is going to have to be aware of the fact that you're going across a network because there are different failure cases that occur when you go across a network. But it's kind of fascinating about this because this applies to human systems as well. If we can look here and we can basically see, look, if the type of communication we have between business and development is in terms of features and estimates, what's missing from this picture? The code, <coughs> right? And, you know, it's, it's like, I mean, this happens in all systems. The weakest point or the thing you're not looking at is quite often the thing which goes and bears the brunt of um, the effects of other things that you're doing, right? So if we're not paying attention to code quality and we're not paying attention to design quality, then, um, you know, that's, that's necessarily going to suffer compared to these other two things that we're looking at. We're looking at the features and the estimates. Now, I'm not trying to go and paint this as like a, like a, a terribly endemic problem within the industry because we are doing better, right? And basically, the original intent within Agile is to basically say the development team is responsible for code quality and design quality. And basically, if they are going and giving you proper estimates, allowing them to go and have the time to refactor and all these things, we never really get ourselves into that, you know, that strange paint in a corner situation where we have so much technical debt that we can't do things effectively. But has that been true over the past 10 years or so? Yes and no. I still visit lots of teams that have terrible technical debt situations, right? And what leads to this in many cases is that developers want to basically please. They want to go and basically give you the features that you want, okay, when you want them, and they'll push it a little bit, right? And then quite often on the business end, it's like we don't really, we don't quite know exactly whether they're doing all the things they need to do to keep things in the, um, in the proper shape to go and add new features in and all these things. So the thing is that basically with this stuff not being part of the main line of communication between business and development, we often end up in a real quagmire. So it leads to technical debt, um, which I like to visualize like this, right? That's a cabin in the woods, right? It's covered by vines. Has anybody ever worked in a code base like that? Yeah. This is the thing which is so, so fascinating to me. We like to think of software as being something which grew out of the mechanical realm because we put it on hardware. But really it's organic and it has all these growth characteristics, right? And we know that as certain things grow, they tend to become a little bit more awkward to deal with. You end up being in the situation where it's kind of unmanageable, right? I would hate to go and stay in that cabin and try to figure out where the windows are, for instance, okay? Um, but that's the situation we end up in, in constantly in software development is that things grow to the point and it's like boiled frog syndrome in a way. It's kind of like it, it happens slowly, slowly, slowly over time and suddenly you realize that basically something was going to take three weeks to do two years ago and now it takes a month and a half, right? And nobody's even really aware of that sort of thing happening. It's just basically the progressive addition of features over time, uh, perhaps lack of refactoring, all these different things. So I think it's problematic that in many software development environments, above a certain level, all we see is the work. We just see stories, tasks, features, all these things. And traditionally within software development, we've basically looked at architecture as being the thing which basically goes and deals with these broader issues. Um, but different companies handle architecture in different ways, right? Some have an architecture group, others basically try to make it an emergent effect of all the decisions that teams make. Quite often it isn't really paid as attention to as often as, um, or as much as it needs to be. It's basically deferred, um, uh, put off to the side next to product decisions, things along those lines. Um, and the thing is that it's just not talked about all that much anymore. So we end up with this. Code blindness, right? Becomes the elephant in the living room. That essentially some things make our work harder over time. We're not really aware of what they are. They're not part of the main discourse that we have day to day about our work. So I wonder about this quite often. And I think that one of the things which is really an aspect of this is that there is a bit of a cultural disconnect between software development developers and business people and organizations. Um, 
It's interesting to notice that when I attend like coaching um, workshops and people doing planning and people doing all these things, there's so many things that we can finesse in the people realm in order to go and basically achieve better outcomes. Okay, we can basically figure out how to interact with people a bit better. We can figure out how to uh, apply a different trick to do planning in a better way. Lots of things work and we're really at that point of going and trying to sort of like find better ways of doing things. But code is hard in many cases, right? Um, anybody who's ever been involved in software development had to basically spend most of their night going and working on a tough to track down problem realizes that this is really the point at which so many things reach hard limits, right? Some things you can't just kind of like push away, you have to go and deal with them. And then you don't have the easier tax to go and arrive at better solutions. And you have to go and sort of like, you know, really dig in, in, in many cases. And um, that's a bit of a cultural disconnect. And I think it's kind of um, one of the things that leads to a bit of a splitting in the community. Um, and it's interesting because some people actually have uh, their foot in both camps in a very strong way. Many people who um, are in natural software development now that basically start from the very early days were developers. They now end up having uh, positions in organizations where they're like C-level people or high-level managers. Some of them I know are still coding day to day, right? And they basically are aware, they keep themselves aware of what these concerns happen to be within the technical realm. Um, it's also interesting to notice that most startups start this way too. Many startups do. Uh, if you've ever heard of ViaWeb, that's one of the first web applications that was ever made back in the middle of the 90s uh, by Paul Graham and some of his schoolmates, right? Paul Graham, who went on to become the um, start, you know, Y Combinator, the, you know, the venture capital uh, group. Um, I remember reading a story about their early days going and developing ViaWeb that was sold off to Yahoo at one point in time and um, hearing him basically say that he was basically taking support calls and making sales calls and hacking Lisp code with his right hand at the same time, right? So you're sitting there and you're doing both things at once, right? And in early stages of startups, quite often you need to do that sort of thing. You're really, you know, you don't have much staff, you need to basically sort of like try to stretch out and master a bunch of different domains. Or if not master them, at least be aware of them and be aware of where the, all, all the edges are. Um, and this still happens to a strong degree within Silicon Valley and some other areas that are startup incubators. Um, I was quite surprised years ago to go to Chicago and work there a bit and realize that their startup culture was quite a bit different. Quite often you had business people who came up with particular ideas and they would say, oh, well, I've got this great idea, let me find a programmer. And if I can find a programmer, then I can, you know, do this and take over the world, right? But the thing is, it's kind of like that's not quite the same, you don't end up with the same culture as if you started out with somebody who really knows technology and knows a bit of business also. Okay, if you just know business and you don't know tech, it's kind of awkward. It's just like the problem you would encounter with the other thing. A person who knows tech but knows nothing about business is probably going to be lost in the woods, right? So we have been basically doing some things in the industry to go and try to move past this a bit. Um, user interface design or UX design, I know over the past five years or so has become a broader, broader discipline and deals with a lot of these product decisions that we're used to going and dealing with. But quite often, you know, this really is ended up being, ended up being a separate community from um, development as well, right? It's like, you know, these product decisions quite often, they aren't really the developers going and doing these sorts of things. And um, they aren't really as intermixed as they need to be. Um, many organizations will have people work like, here's a product person, here's the UX person, here's a developer. They work as a triad to go and solve problems together, but the discipline still feels separate, which is kind of awkward. So what I want to do now is basically talk to you about a bunch of different things that you can, have, that can, you can do in your organizations to go and start to uh, raise awareness of these issues. And it's not just about going and making code better, right? It's not about going and making things sustainable over time. There's also things you can do when you try to go and mix these concerns. This is in technology, which help you arrive at opportunities you might not have seen otherwise. But um, let's talk about a few of them now. So I call this surfacing, surfacing the presence of technology within higher level discussions within the organization. Um, like I said, most people don't really have a strong idea of what their code looks like. You know, we want to believe it's a nice picture like this. Um, but beyond that, it's like, you know, there are visual representations we can use to go and, um, and show what's going on within the code. Have you ever heard of this? It's something called Code City. It's like a tool that you can use to go and basically see uh, complexity of various classes in the system and all these other things. Nice tool. My feeling is it gives us a little bit too much information sometimes. But you can basically have these kinds of representations, these kinds of visualizations, and have communication across your organization about what the health happens to be in the code base. 
And it's an extremely valuable thing to be able to go in and do. And you might wonder, well, why is that really kind of valuable for us? Well, let's take a look at something. Suppose we have like um, a rather simple system here. These are all the features we want to go and have in our system, right? So we're doing like kind of point, in, point of sale, combination point of sale and um, at-home delivery for a grocery store. So it seems like a reasonable set of features for a point of sale system. Okay, does it matter what order we take these features in when we're developing? Yeah, it's kind of funny because the story we tell ourselves in Agile is that it doesn't really matter most of the time, right? You can start just about any place and what you should do is concentrate on the highest business value, right? Concentrate on the things which are going to go and get you to market sooner, um, the things that your customers need, the things which produce value in your particular domain. But the thing is, that we, if we're missing a view of what we currently have, it's hard to go and trade off and make those decisions in a nice way. So one thing I advocate with teams I work with is to make sure that everybody in product has a view of the architecture. And you'll notice here I'm basically using boxes. I'm not using boxes and lines, right? The interrelationships between these things aren't quite as important as knowing that there is an area of the system which is about pricing. There's an area of the system which is about promotions, one for inventory, one for reconciliation. And each one of these things can be graded by health. We can look at each one of these things and basically assess how easy it will be to want to add particular features into it. And then what we can do, after grading these things for health, is run them back and forth against each other, right? So I'm wondering how many of you here have had this conversation with developers, or as developers, whether you've had this conversation with business. There's an idea for a feature, and you say, wow, we can do that, but you know what? If we do that now, it's going to get in the way. There's going to be this thing that's going to happen. Essentially, we have, we have a lot of technical debt in this particular area. It's going to make things worse. If you can defer that feature for a month, then we'll be in a better situation. We'll be able to go and add that feature in a nicer way. So have you ever had that conversation at all? Yeah. And it's nice that you can have that conversation. And that, com that conversation requires visibility. But it also kind of runs against the thing that we've co commonly thought of with an Agile, of saying that we can just do things at any time and it should have no consequence. These things do have consequences. You know, we do have different health in different areas of the system. And um, it's valuable for us to be aware of that. And also, to be able to take these grades of health that we have for various aspects of the system and make sure the business knows about these things over time, right? Um, you know, years ago, and it still happens to some degree in many Agile shops, you would be in a situation where you say, wow, I just want to like, have a re refactoring sprint, right? Because I know that things are really tough right now, and I'd really like to be able to go and take a full sprint to go and refactor this area. And once, once we do that, then everything's going to be a bit better. We're going to be able to go and do, add the features that we want to add and all these other things. And historically in Agile, we've said that that's, roughly, that's a rather bad idea, right? And I, I tend to agree that's a rather bad idea in most cases. But the thing that's really kind of fascinating is that usually when that conversation comes up, somebody in business goes and says, What's going on? I can't believe you're asking for that. Haven't you been tending the system? Haven't you been taking care of it? Why is this happening now, right? So it becomes this, this really awkward conversation. But imagine it going another way. Another way this can go is if basically the business is seeing grades of health for these different areas of code every week, right? And they're seeing what the impact of feature selection is having upon those areas of code. Then none of this is a surprise, right? And it's very easy for you to go and talk to business as a developer and say, look, you know, accepting a gift card that goes and affects pricing and reconciliation, right? And so we know we have some issues with reconciliation right now. What if you pick up split charge right this week and then we'll deal with accepting gift cards next week, right? Having those kinds of conversation. Or push comes to shove and they say, no, for the business, we need to go and have accept gift card right now. And you can say, okay, yeah, but that's going to, you know, it's going to make some things rough in the system. They'll be able to see through the health grades for the system, what the impact is. And then business becomes a part owner of the situation. And this is a little bit scary for developers, right? Because we're scared of micromanagement. We're kind of scared that, you know, if we raise the visibility of all these things, we might get into the situation where business starts trying to make technical decisions for us. And um, I don't think we're quite, I don't think that's something we have to be quite so scared of. Essentially, software is an investment like everything else, right? The things that we do in software, they have to be for the longer term. And if, they, if we're doing things which basically impact our longer term thinking, at least it has to be visible. It has to be visible within the organization that we're making those trade-offs, we're making them consciously. What's happening with technical debt today quite often is that it sneaks up on us. And it slowly increases costs until the point where we can't really do very much. So that's one thing. Conway's Law, 
people here have heard of Conway's Law, right? I think that we're really at the cusp of going and digging into this much deeper than we have in the industry. I think one of the most apparent ramifications of Conway's Law, one of the most apparent effects that we've seen within the industry is the advent of microservices and the recognition that we can have like these two pizza teams that work on services and, and do these various things, that we have a benefit to going and having this focused concentration in a particular area of code. And that we want to go and basically have team structure aligned with code structure. And that's pretty powerful. But the thing is there's so many other things we can do along the lines of this. But it really does depend upon us having visibility into the system and knowing what the organizational impacts happen to be. Right? So a typical thing with this, um, people have for ages been talking about should we have particular domain teams, like have all our front-end developers in one team or spread our front-end developers among these separate teams that have you know, these areas that they're working on, they all need a bit of front-end work. Right? I'm, heard, I'm sure you've had these conversations back and forth about which is the right way. Well, which is the right way? Right? I don't think there's any one right way. What we need to do is basically be aware of what the effects are. So one client I'm working with now, you know, we're in a situation where they're, they're trying to make these decisions. I said, oh, okay, start out with your team of front-end developers working by themselves and interacting with the teams that need to go and basically have their code. And start that way, and then basically after a while, move those front-end developers into the separate teams. Why would that be useful? Well, according to Conway's law, we're going to end up having an API or a separation between that front-end code and the back end if we sort of separate these people off into a separate team. So the cultural difference and quite often the geographic difference will go and form a separation layer within the code. And we can use that as a nice effect. We can also use that as a time for these people to bond together. And then basically once we have that kind of separation in place, then moving them off into separate teams might be a thing we want to do for a period of time. But we can always revisit that, con that conversation. We can always revisit that allocation of people across the um, industry. But the thing is, it really comes down to going having this deep understanding of how our organization affects the software that we're working on. And I don't think I really have time to get today to go deeply into it, but there are so many corollaries to Conway's Law, so many things that, um, that come up when you start noticing how little process changes and things like that impact the structure of the software that you have and its, its quality. <clears throat> Another thing that teams can do, I call this direction mapping. Um, I'm sure some of you have big leg legacy code bases, right? Yeah, it's like a very typical thing in the industry. Um, we often can have a sense of what the architecture is. Uh, we know what areas of code are difficult to deal with. Um, and we kind of like take that knowledge, we kind of just sort of like hold on to it and make decisions slowly because you can't do anything in one fell swoop in a large existing code base. You can't just sort of look, like go in there and like fix one particular thing all that often. Um, but what you can do is you can basically do enough analysis across your code base to be able to uh, decide what you should do when you enter those areas of code, right? You may have one particular area of your system that you don't really modify more than once every two months, for instance. But the thing is, you can basically make an assessment as a team about what its quality is and how we should basically address change in that particular area. And it could be that maybe we have like one area that has like all these god classes and really tangled dependencies, and we're making a decision now to kind of like move off to the side and create new classes, create like a new abstraction around these particular things. And knowing what those things are and how we should engage the code every time we go and come up against it is a pretty powerful thing going forward with things. But again, it comes down to going and taking the software seriously and not just being an issue of like, here's what we do to get these current features in. And then next features, next features, next features. No, we have to have long-term plans for the code base. Um, feature assessment is essentially what I was showing you a little bit earlier. You have all these features. You're assessing them against the quality of the code in the different areas and deciding when you want to go and have particular features and when you don't. Um, has anybody ever rejected a feature in software development? Yeah, it doesn't come up as often as I hope, right? And I think this is really a fascinating thing in the industry, is that because of the separation we quite often have between business and development, we get into this state where we feel like, ah, you know, it's like developer's job is really to go and serve the business. The business knows business better than we do. And even when you have very integrated teams, there's this sense that I'm just a, I'm just a technologist. So I can't really go and say, well, you shouldn't do that, right? But the thing is, people in business quite, aren't, quite often aren't in the situation of understanding what the long-term effects of particular features will be in a code base, right? You can basically get a sense as a business person sometimes about the logistical complication of adding in a particular feature. But without the vision of how that actually impacts the code and the way that it's implemented, 
um, you may not go and see enough of the long-term effects to be able to go and say, wow, you know, I know we can make money that way, but maybe we shouldn't, right? Maybe there's another way of making money that basically doesn't impact our long-term structure in bad ways. So I think that going forward, if we, if we get into the state where people can have these conversations a bit more freely, you know, and recognize that there's a lot that can be done in this area, um, you know, you will probably see this more and more often. Companies deciding to reject particular features, not because of what they would do in their business, but because of the long-term consequences in technically within their organization. And again, mature organizations do this kind of thing routinely, but I don't think we do it at a fine-grained enough level within the industry. Here's a simple one, adding tech to retros. Many people do sprint retrospectives here. How many people ever have a conversation, well, we added this feature in this way, and I don't really like the way I left that class. Maybe the next time we go through, we're going to modify that class in this particular way. Ever have that conversation in retro? Not as often. And why doesn't that happen? I think it comes back to that first slide I had here showing all that code, right? It's like we don't want to, as developers, we don't want to go and sort of like pollute or basically bog down retros with technical concerns because our understanding is that within the team, the technology is something we have under control, right? But we need to at least have a venue with this to go and understand that it's not just a matter of the features, it's a matter of what we've done in the code that's going to be beneficial over time or not so beneficial over time. Those deserve airing, those deserve conversation. And here's another one which is kind of fascinating, feature discovery. So you're working on a team, you have particular features that are coming in, you have particular things that are happening, um, and uh, you may be surprised to go and ask some of the technologists on your team, some of the developers, well, you know, looking at the code the way that you do, um, do you see anything which might be valuable to do that would earn us money, right, or produce value in our market, right? And quite often a developer may not have the full context to be able to go and give you a terribly incisive, like, this is the way that we can go and move forward in a great way and we go and we get all these um, new customers by doing this particular thing. But the thing is they know what's easy and they know what's hard in the code, right? And even if they have incomplete domain knowledge, asking is okay, right? Say, you know, based upon what you see in the system, do you see any opportunities that we're missing here? Right? And sometimes people in technology do, you know? Sometimes they're completely off the mark because they don't have enough of the context, right? It can happen. So this is a practice that you can basically apply, you know, across teams as well. It's like just, let's go ahead and take a day and sort of like ask ourselves, you know, uh, what could we do in a week that would basically go ahead and give us more customer engagement? You know, give us more, uh, more value, all these other things. But just going and sort of spelunking through the code to figure out what's easy to do, right? I think it's Apollo 13. Everybody ever see that movie, Apollo 13, where basically they had, um, they had the capsule and it's like they were about to run out of oxygen and they have this one guy goes and dumps all the stuff on the table and says, this is all the stuff we've got on the capsule. From this, we need to go and extend the oxygen supply by a certain number of hours. And so they worked and worked and worked and worked and worked to figure out what they could do based upon what they had, right? But we hardly ever do that kind of thing in our development, to do that spelunking expedition, to go and ask ourselves, what's easy in the code, right? Maybe there are things that we can do here that will give us value that, you know, we just wouldn't have thought of otherwise, right? So there's a lot of mining we can do in that particular area to go and do things. And here's another one as well. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of this over time, and we are seeing it in some you know, well-developed teams, where product decisions are being made by everybody on the team, right? It's not just a matter of product owner, okay? A um, number of teams I've been seeing recently, it's kind of like, you know, Somebody comes in with a goal. This is the goal, and then basically you guys decide the features to go and figure out how we're going to achieve this goal. That becomes a very integrated process within a team, right? And you may still have like that um, historical role separation that I'm a product person, or I'm a developer, or I'm a UX person, but you should collaborate at a very deep level, you know, in order to go and sort of uh, uh, make these decisions. Here's an interesting one. Imagine being on a team where everybody codes. It's kind of funny about that, right? How many people here co write code routinely? Yeah, a lot of people, right? So a lot of people who may not routinely write code, maybe they don't have a background in writing code, but the thing is it's like, you know, they're, they're, it's like anything else. There's easy aspects, there's hard aspects. I think everybody in a software development organization, especially as software is eating the world, should know a bit about coding. They should know a bit to be able to sit down as, say, a product person with a developer and be able to go and sort of like contribute a little bit and understand what things are. 
And it's not just a matter of going and sort of like getting the literacy in code, but also basically literacy in how decisions compound over time, right? Literacy in what technical debt happens to be, all these things. You can get firsthand experience of this sort of thing. And frankly, if you want to go further with this, there are some organizations. There's one um, unruly media in London, and it's kind of fascinating because in their teams, they have people who are writing code as well as doing market analysis, market research, um, all these other things. It's kind of like the, the other end of the whole DevOps thing, right? It's the other end of like support your code in production, right? It's like support all the decisions that lead into you writing that particular piece of code. Um, and I remember talking to somebody at this organization, and they were saying, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have really adopted this model. Um, over time, we found that it kind of works for us. And some of the people that are kind of key in this organization came from some very early extreme programming teams in London. So they have a long, long history in Agile. Um, but the story I kind of heard is it's kind of hard to hire people sometimes because it's like somebody coming into the organization says, well, I just want to be a QA person, or I just want to be a developer. They don't really want to go and sort of like explore all these other domains. Um, but, you know, the thing is, it's like we've, we've noticed over and over again in software development that basically it's the handoff that kills us, right? Handoff between one group and another. So if we can basically straddle the line a bit and basically have skills in two areas, then we have more integrated knowledge, we can make better decisions going forward with things. Um, so I've been kind of like calling this full spectrum development a bit, right? Essentially that if you are doing software development, you should know a bit about marketing. You know, you should know a bit about accounting. You should know a bit about the domain that you're working in. You should know a bit about writing code, a bit about operations, a bit about all these things. Not everybody's going to want to go there in most organizations, right? Um, but I think that there are advantages for organizations that do choose to go in these directions, right? Provided they can actually find people who want to go and do this kind of thing. Um, in one organization, they said, yeah, yeah, we're having trouble you know, hiring people that want to do this sort of thing. And I said, well, you know, if you hire these people and say, hey, stay with us for two years, you'll be ready to do your own startup. Because essentially, you've seen all aspects of business. Because you know, we, we have not really assumed that you are a QA person. We've not assumed that you're a business analyst. We've not assumed you're a developer. We've assumed that you're a person who learns, right? And a person who learns can basically pick up enough of each of these pieces to be able to go and see them all the way across the span and be able to be a contributor that way. Now, again, not everybody's going to want to do this sort of thing. But you know, funny, I was talking to a friend in the industry, and she was saying that when she hires, she likes to hire people with two strong domains, right? And she just finds that as you hire more of these people, you have these relationships where basically it's like people fit together in a particular way where there's less and less miscommunication across the organization because there's these areas of overlapping domain. Another thing as well, dynamic reteaming, okay? Um, is forming a team hard? We have made that assumption for decades in this industry, right? Um, well, you can tell I've got my gray hair, so I've been around for a while in the industry. At one point in time in the industry, we made the assumption that integration was hard. Integrating code was very hard, so we decided not to do it very often, right? Once every week, you basically integrate your code into the main line. That's about it. And um, in the early days of Agile, we kind of recognized that, wow, you know, if something seems like it's very hard, you just need to do it more frequently until you basically make it easy for yourself. There's a skill to going and doing this particular thing. And um, I noticed that across you know, my time in the industry, I spent a lot of time working as a consultant. And as a consultant, you have to basically step into a different organization every couple of weeks or so and basically get along with people there, learn how to work with them, and essentially become part of a team, right? There's no reason why we can't do this sort of thing within current software development organizations, right? Essentially, you can have an organization where everybody becomes skilled at reteaming. They become skilled at this practice of like, okay, we have a group of like five to ten people. We need this group to go and do this particular thing, get together and work on this particular thing. And there are practices around this that can be helpful. There's um, uh, a woman in the industry, Heidi Helfand, who's basically working on more work um, around this, some things that she's developed at the company she's working with. Um, and you might look at this and say, well, gee, why is this important? Why would we really care to go and reform teams all the time? But it comes down to this key thing that I'm kind of alluding to, but I haven't really stated out right yet. In a software development organization, the code is real, and we don't get to basically hide it under the rug anymore. What we need to be able to do is basically be aware of what it needs and tend it, right? And different areas of code are going to need different skill sets at different times. 
And for that reason, we need to be able to go and organize and galvanize the people to go and work on those particular areas at different times. And then if the code needs something else, then different people go in different areas and work on different things. None of this is basically static. It's all very fluid. And if you have the ability to go and reteam, then you're able to go and do this sort of thing consistently. So paying attention to what the software needs. And it's not just the software also, okay? It's really also what do you need in your organization in terms of skill, right? Um, one team I work with, um, they have a skills board where basically they sort of show all the different skill areas that different developers and different, you know, QA people have developed over time, and you can basically see who knows this area and who doesn't know this area. And, you know, there's kind of like a, a salient thing there that, yeah, over time, you should be picking up more skill areas. But uh, within the organization, even, even if it happens emergently, fine. If it doesn't happen emergently, um, having some awareness of what the skill set is across the organization and be able to go and say, wow, you know, Kelly, it's like it'd be great if you were over here for a period of time because this area really needs it. And Kelly can say, yeah, sure, I'll go over there for a while because I kind of know. And then she gets to work with a bunch of other people who go and start getting some of her skill, and then they get skills on the board, and you move forward with things. So it's completely dynamic. It's completely active. Okay? Another thing. I'm calling this feature deletion, but I don't want to call it that. I really want to call it code deletion, but we're not there yet, right? How many people have found cases where you can delete features in production? It happens sometimes, but usually it's a very integrated decision that has, has to happen between business and technology, right? You have to go and look at this and say, is it easy to excise this particular thing? Um, are we happy giving up these customers or transitioning them to another aspect of the system? We don't do this sort of thing often enough. And I think the thing which is rough is that there really is a carrying cost to code, right? And it's not just the code. There's a carrying cost to support for particular features. And we're never really aware of the total cost of these things. And if we were, we might make some different decisions, OK? Um, we don't really have an active culture within software development right now of deleting code. Um, if you talk to people in the industry who've been around for a while, they say, oh, one of the things I love most is to delete code. And it's like, I feel good about that, too, as a developer. Because quite often, the code you want to delete, you know, you discover that, you know, you've been tripping over it for years. It's kind of like it occludes your view of the system because the assumption is that it's really valuable, that it's really necessary. And it may not be valuable or necessary. And if you can actually go ahead and delete it, you know, you're better off. You make the system simpler. And we really should strive towards having simpler systems. Uh, so, yeah, it'd be great to go and see more energy around this particular thing. But first steps first, you need to have awareness of the code, right? Okay. Feature decisions, yeah, it's kind of easy. You can say, yeah, you know, not so many people are using this particular thing, but the carrying cost of the code is the vital thing. Noticing that um, your system could be much easier, and actually some of the features that you want to go and add in later would be easier to add in if this particular feature wasn't there. And if you aware of, are aware of what those costs are, then you can make the trade-off. Without being aware, you can't really make the trade-off. Okay? So I kind of started talking about this when I was talking about dynamic reteaming, rotating. Um, it's a nice thing to go and get into the habit of understanding that you, it's not just about forming new teams and going and breaking teams apart and stuff like this, but actually rotating people through different areas of the system, right? Or basically going in, at least having the value of doing that, and people can make their own choices about where to work in particular uh, times in the, uh, um, in the system. Um, yeah, very valuable thing. You know, it's like uh, I have so often visited organizations where they basically have this notion that once you've gelled a team very well, um, you're done. It's kind of like these people at this table, they've worked together for the past year. They know how to get things done, right? You know, forming, norming, storming. They have the whole thing down. Um, but you get baked in sometimes. You need to see other things. You need to expand your skill set. And if we have the ability to go and reteam effectively, we can do this. And we can start to go and think about skill allocation things. I remember years ago, there was like this big fight in the industry about feature teams and component teams. And there was a lot of talk about these things. And still, that conversation, that debate still continues in some segments in the industry. Um, but one thing that uh, uh, many people arrived at was the notion that feature teams are better, right? If you have a team and you can say to them, okay, well, you know, you are a gel team and we're going to give you these stories and these stories and these stories and these stories, and you get to touch any place in the code that you want to in order to go and actually do these things. Um, it can work out okay, but the thing is you can also end up in this, being in this um, tragedy of the commons situation, being in a situation where basically nobody really feels enough ownership to go and sort of like make the proper decisions in order to go and move things effectively. And quite often, this is not, this is not a matter of being, people being lazy or malicious. It's just the cognitive situation of, being, of dealing with different areas of the system all the time and not really specializing. 
So the thing I typically say to teams is like, you know, you can have feature teams and component teams and product teams, teams focused around a particular domain. You can do all these things in order to go and optimize your development, but these are decisions you continually revisit. And you continually revisit who's on these teams in order to go and get the skill set exactly where, they want, where we want it to be. Um, we've said people over process for over a decade now in this industry, in Agile, right? But still is there's this notion of like, okay, well, I just need a QA person here. I just need a UX person here, right? People have different skill sets, and you can work with them for their career growth and also for the growth of your system, being able to attend it very well. And here's, a, I think, the last one I've got. System as stakeholder. This is a strange idea. Um, I remember talking to some friends um, a while back, and they were talking to me about something called um, actor network theory, okay, which is essentially a, um, a branch of um, social system sociology by a guy named Bruno Latour, a Frenchman named Bruno Latour. And um, a friend of mine who was telling me about this said that it's kind of fascinating because you try to look at systems uh, from the point of view that there are these inanimate objects and there are the people involved, and they're the same. They're basically co-equal in a way, right? So um, the example that he basically used in the um, early extreme programming days was like, okay, you have index cards, right, that you use for story planning and all these other things, and you have people on the team, and it's like, you know, the story cards are an actor in the system just like the people on the team are, right? And it's funny about this because we can do that same, with our, same thing with our systems. Um, imagine doing this. Imagine having like a, a role-playing thing on your team where you anthropomorphize different parts of your system, right? So imagine stepping into, um, uh, you know, stepping into the, the mindset of being, I am the data store for this persistent service, right? And it's like, okay, what I need right now is like, I, there's parts of me that are kind of grubby. I need this particular area to be cleaned up. I won't be able to go and handle these particular requests if I don't have these particular things. So it's almost like a role-playing thing in a way. But going and sort of like getting us to ourselves to the point of going and recognizing that it's not just us, okay? It's not just teams. It's not just people. We basically exist in our companies in a symbiotic relationship um, with the technical systems that we have, right? And to the degree that we're blind to that, we s we're suboptimal, right? And we can make some decisions that are not based on full awareness. Um, I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing happen where you make a particular technical decision, you have an area of the system which is really hard to go and modify, and as a result of that hardness to modify, you end up going in creating a new division around that system, and it actually impacts organizational structure, the intractability of your code, right? So it's not just a matter of us saying, hey, we've got stories, we've got features, we've got our team structure, we've got all this planning. These things that we have in our systems, these parts of our systems, are stakeholders as well. And we haven't really taken that view and kind of pushed it as far as we can in the industry yet. Um, I think there's something there. I think it's really worthy of experimentation. So... Yeah, I think um, this is a key one, tending the system. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, it, it's it's going to be tough for me to go and uh, talk about this because I'm not against it, right? I think it's important for us to be happy at work, right? I think teams are vitally important. Communication is vitally important, all these different things. But at the end of the day, we're producing value in our business and stuff like this, but we're also caretakers in a way, right? We are caretaking these systems that we have under our control. We're caretaking these systems that we've actually created, right? The things that we do now are going to impact our long-term health. And the long-term health of particular areas of our code are going to impact the long-term health of our organization, right? But we haven't really cultivated this point of view yet, I don't think, in the industry. If you're a caretaker, you take a different vision of things, okay? You make sure that everybody understands enough about the architecture to basically know what the impacts are and you're thinking about what's going to happen six months from now and a year from now if you make bad decisions. And that doesn't mean that we can't go ahead and sort of push forward and do all the emergent design stuff we've been doing for quite a while in the industry. We can, but basically visibility and awareness are quite vital, okay? And um, we just have to do what it takes to go and basically keep these systems um, healthy. That's our job, right? Not just developers, product people too. Everybody who's involved because we are becoming very, very software intensive, not just what we call traditionally the software industry, but all businesses now are getting in that space. So it's an obligatory symbiosis, symbiosis picture, right? Okay. Where's Nemo, right? Okay. So. <coughs>
yeah, there's a symbiotic relationship between clownfish and um, sea anemone. I forget the details exactly, but I think the way the skin is on the fish is such that they can't be stung. I, I forget the details. You can look it up if you want to. But this happens in nature all the time, right? And you know, we just have to realize that we are in the symbiotic relationship with our technical systems and behave appropriately. So that's what we wanted to say. You know, software shapes business. Shape of our software is vital information. I have some variations of this that I've spoken at um, uh, various different conferences. I think one of the ones I feel most strongly about is at the, um, I think it's two years ago at the Craft Conference in Budapest. Um, I have Conway's Law in the title, so, and I believe this will be, you know, uh, dispersed as well. Do I see anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, well, wait a second. One more. Say it one more time. Creating software help. Grading software. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, grading software health. Okay. The thing about this, which is rough, you know, I remember like um, in Jurgen's um, uh, keynote this morning, he was going and talking. He made a couple of jokes that were kind of like, uh, you know, once the technologist involved, all this detail comes into play because. Technologists, quite often, what we want to do is we want to give you everything that you need to be able to make a decision, right? Uh, so we'll give you more information than you need as a business sometimes. But the thing is, you can have a very reduced information load um, common model of a system with business. Uh, for me, it's usually like five to seven pieces. If I can basically go ahead and break my system apart into five to seven pieces I can communicate with business about and tell them what the impacts are for particular features that they need. Um, then we can have a good conversation around these things. And for me, generally, I would say, like, you know, uh, health grades are between, like, 1 and 10. You know, just sort of like, say, this is a 7 right now. Two weeks ago, it was an 8, but you remember you did this thing, and then we're down to 7, we're trying to bring it back to 8, that kind of thing. There's a certain amount of kind of, like, um, fiction. It's kind of like it's not, these are not, like, based upon hard measurement. They're really based upon subjective assessment that you basically bring as a... <laughs> Just to the table. So, does that help? Okay. Where? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, the <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Getting over cold, as everybody can tell. Um, so the question was really, do I think there's a business opportunity in tending the system? Um, I think we've called it maintenance for ages, right? You know. Um, but what I what I really kind of rebel against is this seeing it purely just in terms of cost of work terms. It has to be in terms of like what does this system do for us going forward? Um, for quite a while, people have like rebelled in the software industry against the notion of seeing IT as a cost center. And we're getting closer and closer to realizing now that it's more of an investment, particularly as we have things like personalization and all these other things that um, are really differentiators for most businesses now that require substantial IT investment. Um, so in terms of that, I, I think it just it comes down to us really being aware of these things, really being aware of what the longer-term effects of some of the decisions we make happen to be and what the current state of the systems we currently have is, and making sure that discussion is part of um, ongoing discussion about uh, the development that we do. Yeah. Okay, so the question is really, have I found tools that really help with visualization of technical debt that I would, um, would advocate? Um, not particularly, and I think the thing that's rough about that is I don't, 
I think that we can really get ourselves trapped by that a bit. You know, and I, there's been a lot of discussion in the industry about the, the danger of metrics. Like quite often, if we are too allegiant to particular metrics, we can end up being steered wrong because we're never actually measuring the thing. We're basically applying a particular measure that um, um, approximates the thing, right? And that's very true in technical debt because there's a lot of technical debt that is measurable in terms of like complexity of code and um, you know change characteristics and stuff like this that doesn't really impact you because it doesn't really if these are areas of code that you aren't really touching all that frequently, you could spend a lot of time working on them and not actually, you know, gain any significant value. Um, so I really haven't seen anything in the tooling space that I think is definitive. Um, I think that it's one of those things that basically a lot of um, developers can basically bring their professional judgment to bear. Uh, one of the things I've been working on talking to people a bit is kind of like repurposing the term technical debt a bit and saying that what technical debt is really is it's basically the cost of the refactoring that you would do in order to go and add in a particular feature. And so that basically means that you can't really have an absolute measure. And what you're doing is you're going and assessing the state of the code relative to something that you want to add to it. And I think that that's a really valuable perspective for us to go and have. Because ultimately, it's the change characteristics which are important going forward in the code, not the absolute amount of complexity we happen to have in particular areas. So. <coughs> yes? Okay, what would I ask? The, <coughs> excuse me. The team, in a retrospective, in order to go and get at the code needs, um, I'd ex ask them to explain their work, and if it wasn't technical, I'd ask them why it wasn't technical, just to break the ice, right? It's kind of like, okay, well, surely there was an area of the system you were working on when this happened, right? It's like, okay, what does that area of the system do, right? And if you are, if you're technical, that's great. If you're facilitating, if you're not technical, um, getting people to understand that these conversations can be as much about technology as they can be about the work also. Um, that's important. I think once you break that barrier, then you're really in a good state because then you have that avenue for going and deciding as a team how do we approach the solution of various technical problems, right? This kind of thing happens informally in many teams anyway, but um, I think in terms of going and uh, raising the value of that conversation in an organization, uh, just asking those questions in the beginning is, is valuable. You know, it's like saying, okay, tell me more about what, what happened technically there. Why aren't you talking to me about the technical thing that happened there, right? So, yeah. A little louder, please. Okay, so the question is really about technical debt or seeing technical debt as the things which happen when you have like two generations of product. You have like a new generation of product and an older generation. You add features to the new generation, but you never get around to adding them to the older generation, right? And you never get the new generation to have all the old features as well, right? So you know what's funny is that businesses make these decisions all the time uh, pragmatically, right? Um, they find that they have a particular piece of code or they have a particular system. It could be because of vendor relationships. It could be because of many different things. It could be because of code quality. For some reason, it's really hard to work on this particular product. So what you do is you create a second product, right? And it's kind of like you want to go and overlap enough with the old product to go and get some of the people from the old product to be on the new product, but you never get around to doing it completely, right? That's just, I, I think that's really the most important thing is for us to go and recognize that this is a thing which goes and points to the reality of technical debt, right? The reason that we would basically choose to go and sort of like create a new product and now work on the old one is because of this characteristic of software, right? And once we basically accept that that is the way things go, that's the way things typically happen, we have the opportunity now to go dig deeper into those things and say, how do we do this consciously and strategically? And, um, you know, a thing I've been really um, playing around with with various different people is like, uh, can we actually start to design systems where we can choose to go and basically create systems, excuse me, 
We actually design systems that are basically designed to have pieces replaced progressively over time, right? So designing for replacement, as opposed to going and building these monoliths that we really find hard, uh, you know, it's hard to go and actually extend and do these things. Um, I, I don't have a solution to that uh, in terms of like whether you would see this as technical debt or not. I just think it's really important for us to go and accept that that's the reality, and that can be a focus of business planning is to understand that that you know you may have to go and branch off into a separate version that will never cover all the old features. You know, that's just the way things are. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as Colleen mentioned this morning, we Agile Denver made a donation in Michael and Jorgen's name to Heifer International to send two girls to school who otherwise would not have the opportunity. We won't be having closing remarks at the end of the day, so I just want to touch on a few things. Uh, we had to make a last minute schedule change. Uh, Tommy Norman was not able to join us today due to a last minute family matter that kept him from coming out to Denver. Uh, so the using flow-based road mapping options session at 415 will be in both Centennial A and Centennial B simultaneously. Uh, still have opportunity to Stop by and uh, talk to Women Who Code. Um, see how you can get involved and potentially help coach or mentor, if that's your thing. Uh, sponsors, please take the opportunity to visit our sponsors. Many of our sponsors are multi-year sponsors at this point. Uh, their donations or their contributions make this conference very affordable for our attendees and we value them greatly. Uh, finally, uh, we hope that you'll take a moment, or if you have the time, drop by, uh, join us at Lime at Denver Pavilions for the after conference social sponsored by version one. And I hope you all have an enjoyable remainder of the conference. <laughs>